All right, today we're going to learn two ways in which we can measure the speed of light. The first way was a way that was devised by Galileo. This is a way that isn't the greatest. It's a good idea. Okay, in theory, it's like, ah, you know what? That's, that's kind of smart. But in practice, it doesn't work out so well. Let me explain how exactly he did this. Galileo's got two hills about a kilometer apart. He's got an assistant. Um, Galileo has a lantern, a lamp, okay, that he has covered up. His assistant on the other hill also has a lantern that's covered up. So here's Galileo on one hill. He's standing there on the top of that hill with a lantern that's covered up. Here's his assistant over here. He's standing on the front slope of that hill because of our... This is in the way. They're about a kilometer apart. Galileo decides, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uncover my lantern. The light is then going to shine. So he uncovers his lantern, the light shines, and it goes toward his assistant on the second hill a kilometer away. When his assistant sees the light, so it's not instant, right? Although it's pretty close because it's only a kilometer away. When his assistant sees the light that Galileo produced when he took the cover off of his lantern, his assistant uncovers his lantern. So then that light from the second hill, from his assistant, travels back towards Galileo. Galileo's light travels this way. When his assistant sees it, his, he uncovers his lantern. His light travels toward Galileo. When Galileo detects the, the light produced by the assistant, he stops his timer. So he starts a timer when he produces his own light, he stops his timer when he detects the light that was produced by his assistant. Well, then this should be an easy calculation to determine what the speed of light was, right? V is equal to D over T. The distance here is going to be two kilometers. Because his light traveled a kilometer, his assistant's light traveled a kilometer, the total distance traveled by the light during that time was a kilometer. He divides that by the time that he measured and calculates the speed of light. Easy, right? But it doesn't work very well. Even if he did get a number that was really close to the accepted value for the speed of light, the currently known value for the speed of light, it wouldn't mean anything. It would be purely coincidence. It would be purely luck. Why wouldn't it mean anything? Why is the speed of light calculation that he gets a meaningless calculation? Why is he going to be probably way, way off? Josh? Yeah, yeah, perfect, perfect, perfect answer. The distance is way too small. Light travels, although he didn't know this, right? He didn't know what the speed of light was when he did this experiment. But light travels across Canada, back and forth, about 30 return trips. Halifax to Victoria, back to Halifax again, 30 times in one second. That's how fast light travels. 30 return trips across the second biggest country in the world in one second. If light travels that fast, it's going to travel that two kilometer distant, distance so ridiculously fast that these guys' reaction time of taking the cover off the lantern and stopping a stopwatch is going to be so ridiculously off. The reaction time is going to be so bad, so huge in comparison to the time that it took the light to travel, that any measurement it gets is going to be completely meaningless. Okay, it's going to mean nothing. Why was it way off? It basically comes down to reaction time. I don't even know what number he got, to be honest. I'm not sure what the number was, but it doesn't matter because it's a meaningless number. Even if he did, again, get something close to 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, it wouldn't mean anything. It would have been pure luck because reaction time would have been so ridiculous. Well, that's easy enough, right? It's a good thing the easy one, it's a good thing we've gone through an easy one here now. Um, good thing that uh, the one that is so ridiculous is easy. You'd hate to invest a whole lot of time uh, learning how to understand something that's, that's, uh, that we actually have to use. Okay? Or we don't have to use, I should say. This one's a little bit harder. Unfortunately, this is the one we're going to have to use. The good news is, once we understand it, the calculations are, are very, very easy. 
The good news is the calculations are very easy, and we're almost certainly going to see one of these on our diploma exam. Okay, we always do. There's always one of these Mickelson calculations. Pay attention. Don't write this down yet, okay? I'll give you a chance to write it down in a moment here. Just notice the spelling mistake. It shouldn't be an A there. Mickelson performed an experiment where, first of all, he used a much bigger distance. The distance was 35 kilometers instead of one kilometer. Okay, so that's a much bigger distance. Although still, the reaction time involved in a 35 kilometer distance or a 70 kilometer round trip distance would still be ridiculously big compared to the time that it took the light to travel that far. It's a much bigger distance, okay, which helps, but the way he measures the time is the real improvement of our Galileo system. Here's what he does. He's got two mountains 35 kilometers apart. He's got a light source right here. Okay, that light will travel this way. He directs it this way, towards this octagonal object that has a mirror on each of the faces, on each of the sides. So there's a mirror right here, there's a mirror right here, right here, and so on. Okay, that octagonally shaped mirror is at rest. When he shines the light off of this side, it reflects down here to another mirror on the other mountain, reflects back this way, reflects off of another side, gets detected right here. Make sense? He hasn't measured anything yet, but at least the, the light is being detected by this guy over here, the observer. He can't measure that time. Pull out a stopwatch, measures the time. He's still going to get a time that's ridiculously off because of reaction time. We're still dealing with a really, really small distance in the grand scheme of things. So what does he do? He starts rotating this mirror. He starts spinning it. As he starts spinning it, what happens? This guy doesn't observe the light anymore. Why not? Well, because when he starts spinning it, side one, that was the side that the uh, light, initial light was being reflected off of, now instead of pointing in this direction, now points in some other direction, maybe like this. Where does the light go now? Well, it reflects off of side one and bounces down here somewhere. It doesn't hit the mirror on the other mirror on the other mountain, 35 kilometers away. If it doesn't hit that mirror, it's not bouncing back and going to the observer. So the observer doesn't see anything. He turns the mirror on. It starts rotating. The observer doesn't see anything. So what does he do? He turns up the frequency of the mirror. He cranks it up a little bit, makes it go a little bit faster. Okay, the light reflects in some other direction, turns it up a little bit faster. The light reflects in some other direction, turns it up a little bit faster. And all of a sudden, the observer detects it again. So now this mirror is spinning, and the observer is detecting the light. Why? Well, let's say we've got side number one. Let's label these sides. Number one, number two, number three. Okay, and we don't really need to label the rest of them there. Sides one, two, and three. If it's not moving, then the light reflects off of side one and side three and gets detected by the observer. If it is moving, it reflects off of side one, but it reflects off in some kind of crazy direction. But if it's moving at just the right rate, side one will be over here. And side two will be over here. And side eight will have come in to take the place of side one. Now the light will reflect off of side eight, down here, off of side two, and get detected by the observer. That only happens if the mirror has made one-eighth of a revolution, right? One-eighth of a revolution in the time that it took the light to go from here back to here. Does that make sense? Okay, if it's made one-eighth of a revolution, then side number one is where side number two was. Side number eight is where side number one was. And we get the same shape. It's just reflecting off of a different side and getting detected by the observer. So, now the observer detects the light. We know the frequency of the rotating mirror. That's a lot easier to determine. The frequency of the rotating mirror is a lot easier to determine than the time is. Even if we're off by a little bit on the frequency, that's okay. okay there's no reaction time involved in the frequency. And that's the big thing right there. 
if we know the frequency, then we can determine the period easily. And from the period, we can determine how long it took the light to travel from here to here and back to here. And if we know the time and we know the distance, then we can determine the speed of light. Does that make some sense? Good point, Jenner. Um, that should say, that's another typo. It should say, uh, no, no, that's right, actually. Um, yeah, sorry, right there. Or a multiple of one eighth of revolution. Because you can imagine how, listen, uh, when I described that the first time, I said site eight has come in to replace site one, site one replaces site two, site two replaces site three. Well, it could have made two eighths of revolution, right? And site seven could have come in here, site eight here, and site one there. We get the same effect, right? But we don't normally do that. We don't normally do a multiple of one eighth of revolution because you're turning the frequency up, right? And the first time when it's rotating that you see the light at the detector, well, that's going to be one eighth of revolution, right? In order to get two eighths or three eighths, you've got to turn the frequency up, right? And you're probably not going to do that. Why would you? You've detected the EMR, you've detected the light at the observer. Why would you turn it up further? Because you've just accomplished what you wanted to do. So it could happen at a higher multiple, but usually we don't see that. So how exactly are we going to use this to determine the speed of light, calculation-wise, that is? Well, the good news is there's two equations that we're always going to use here. They're always the same two. That's what makes this easy. That's what makes the calculations involved here easy. That's why when we see this question on a diploma exam, we should get it. Every single one of us should get it. Okay? What I want you to do is write down these two equations every time you see one of these Michelson rotating mirror questions. V equals T over T, and T is equal to 1 over F. V equals D over T is the constant speed equation. It represents the speed of light as it goes from one side of the rotating mirror down to the curved mirror on the other mountain up to the other side of the rotating mirror. So it's that 70 kilometer distance over which the light travels. The speed at which it travels over that 70 kilometers. T, little t here, well that represents the time that it took to travel that 70 kilometer distance. Over on the other side we see a big T. That represents the period. That's the time that it takes the mirror to make one complete revolution. Okay, the rotating mirror makes one complete revolution in that amount of time. F is the frequency. Usually we're given the frequency of the rotating mirror. What I want you to do when you've written down these two equations every single time is plug numbers in and get something out of it. I don't care what you get out of it. Get something out of it. I guarantee you it will not be the answer you're looking for. The first number that pops out of these two equations will not be the answer you're get looking for. It will almost certainly be a time. It'll either be big T or little t. Big T or little t. Okay, the time for one complete revolution or the time that it takes the light to go from here to here and back to here, which is the time for one eighth of revolution. You're going to solve for one of those times. And you're going to, from that time, get the other time. If you've got the time for one eighth of a revolution, get the time for one revolution by multiplying it by eight. If you've got the time for one revolution, then get the time for one eighth of a revolution by dividing by eight. Plug numbers in, get a time, then get the other time. And then solve for what you're looking for. Sounds easy. It is. Okay, let's do an example. The set of rotating mirrors in Mickelson's experiment was rotating at 533 hertz, and the curved mirror was 35 kilometers away. Show how Mickelson determined the speed of light from these data. Let's just get the speed of light from this data. So we've got a frequency of the rotating mirror here. It's 533 hertz. And we've got the, the mirrors 35 kilometers away. That means the distance the light has to travel is going to be 70,000 meters, right? 70 kilometers or 70,000 meters. We want to get V. Two equations, right? Every time. V equals D over T. G is equal to 1 over F. Same way every single time. Remember the strategy? It's a great strategy. Just plug in whatever and solve for whatever. You don't have to worry about anything here. We're looking for V. Don't know it. D, we do. 70,000 meters. 
T, we don't know it, all right? It wasn't very helpful. Let's plug in numbers to the other one. T, do we know it? No, we don't. F, do we know it? Yes, 533 hertz. Okay, let's go 1 divided by 533 and see what big T is, see what the period is here. 0 0.001876 seconds, all right? What have we just found? I told you, you're going to find something. It's not what you're looking for, but you're going to get something out of this. What is this? It's the time for one complete revolution. Remember what we said, though? We don't want the time for one revolution. Okay, we always want the other time. Whatever time comes out of this, we want the other one. So how do we get the time for one-eighth of revolution? Divide it by eight. So the time for one-eighth of a revolution, can't say it, of a revolution, the time for one-eighth of a revolution is 0 0.001876 divided by 8. What is that, Tanner? 2.345 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. Now, we've got the time for one-eighth of a revolution. Let's go 70,000 meters divided by 2.345 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds, and what do we get for that? Uh, 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Three digits here, 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Got it. Well, that's a pretty good value. That's pretty darn close to the currently accepted value. The currently accepted value to three digits, in fact, is 3.00. Okay, it goes further, 2.999, whatever. Okay, but the three digits, that's good. All we did here, guys, two equations. Right? Same as we always do. Same two equations. Plug your numbers in. Get one of the times. Get either big T or little t. In this case, we got big T. You get big T, divide by 8. If you get little t, what are you going to do? Times it by 8. Plug it into the other equation. Solve for what you're looking for. Done. Got it? All right. There are three questions that go along with this. I'd like you, before the end of class today, guys, to finish question number one. So let's work on question number one right now. And try to get that done before the bell goes today, just so that we make sure we're kind of on the right track. Okay, we're not going to worry about question two and three, and I'll explain later why we're not going to worry about two and three right now. Okay, we'll worry about those tomorrow. Just focus on number one right now and try to get that done, please. Okay, let's quickly do this. We got a 12-sided mirror. Okay, we got a speed given to us is 2.88 times 10 to the 8. 30 kilometers there, 30 kilometers back. Uh, we want to know the frequency this time. So let's say V is equal to D over T, and let's say T is equal to 1 over F. This T represents the time for 1 12th of revolution. This is 1 revolution. Let's plug in some numbers. We know what V is. It's 2.88 times 10 to the 8. The example question we did, we didn't know what V was. That's what we were trying to find. We know what D is. It's 60,000 meters. That allows me to solve for T, the time for 1 12th of revolution. What does that work out to be? Lots of you have this already. So, Somebody tell me what T is. 2.083 times 10 to the negative 4 seconds. Remember, that's not the time that I want. Whatever time that I get is not the time that I want. What do I got to do with that? Let's times it by 12. What do we get for that? The time for 1 revolution. One second, guys. What is it? 0 0.0025 seconds. Hold on, please. So now we're going to say 0 0.0025 is equal to 1 over F, solve for frequency, and that should give me 400 hertz. If you're dealing with a question like this and the distance is in that range that Mickelson used, 30, 35, 40 kilometers, and you're dealing with an eight sided mirror, a 10-sided mirror, something in that range that Nicholson used, then you're probably going to end up with a frequency that's 4, 5, 6, 700 hertz, 10 to the 2 hertz. Okay, if you're dealing with numbers in your question that are dramatically different, then this is going to be dramatically different as well. But normally, you should expect 10 to the 2, something, times 10 to the 2 hertz. Okay? Your homework is those check and reflect questions. Let's finish those up for tomorrow, and we'll, we'll continue on this uh, tomorrow in class. Have a good night, guys. Thank you.